Welcome to GRE. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. First, my housing update. Then, people hate paying taxes. Well, then, opt out of it. How do you do that legally? The government will pay you to invest in these seven places that we're going to discuss today. One common activity is so incentivized that it's rare for anyone to ever pay tax on it. Today on Get Rich Education. Knowing the difference between a turnkey provider and a vertically integrated rental property company can cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars over the life of your investment. Some companies sell you a property they don't own, renovate it with contractors they don't control, refer you to a property management company they don't manage, all in multiple markets because they can't source enough inventory. That's why truly passive investors work with our friends at JWB Real Estate Capital, perhaps the country's only vertically integrated rental property investment company. They operate in one market, Jacksonville, Florida, and their whole job is to make investing in rental properties easy for you. In fact, because of their vertically integrated approach, their clients have gained 79% more home price appreciation than the overall Jacksonville market since 2013. Find out more about why it pays to invest with JWB. Call them at 904-677-6777 or go to jwbrealestate.com slash GRE. GRE listeners can't stop talking about their service from Ridge Lending Group and MLS 42056. They've provided our tribe with more loans than anyone. They're truly a top lender for beginners and veterans. It's where I go to get my own loans for single-family rental property up to fourplexes. So start your pre-qualification and you can chat with President Chaley Ridge personally. They'll even deliver your custom plan for growing your real estate portfolio. Start at RidgeLendingGroup.com. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Welcome to GRE from Kent, Ohio to Tash, Kent, Uzbekistan and across 188 nations worldwide. You're listening to one of America's longest running and most listened to shows on real estate investing. How many Uzbeks in the house here anyway? I'm Keith Weinhold. This is Get Rich Education, episode 406. When you hear about home price appreciation, you know, it's almost always reported in year over year. Fashion, that's valuable to know. But Visual Capitalist just shared with us a nice color-coded map of state-by-state U.S. home price appreciation since 1991. This is really good stuff. Yeah, so over the last 31 years then. So let's break this down and talk about some of these states. First, as a nation, since 1991, do you have any guess as to what percent home prices have appreciated? And we're only talking about single family homes here. Any guess? Over the last 31 years, on a national basis, it is a 275% cumulative price appreciation in that time. Now, to annualize that, you can't just take 275 and divide it by 31. That would give you about 9%, but you can't do that. It wouldn't account for compounding. All right, so it's under 9% per annum nationally. Let's see which states had some of the highest and lowest appreciation over the last 31 years. And again, these are single family homes since 1991. All right, a notable one is Tennessee because that ranked 12th, 12th highest in appreciation in that time. And I'm mentioning that one because it's such a popular investor state. Well, it has appreciated 317%. Tenth most is Wyoming. Ninth is Florida. Florida has 389% appreciation in that time. Of course, it's going to vary town by town. We're just talking on the state level here. Eighth is Arizona. And again, this is the ranking of the states that have had the most single family home price appreciation from 1991 until today. The seventh most appreciation has been in Washington State. Numbers six, five, and four are also in the northwestern quadrant of the U.S. They are Idaho, Oregon, and then Montana. Number three is 
Washington, D.C. with 556% appreciation. Oh, yes, government just expands, doesn't it? (laughs) Number two is Colorado. And number one, the number one appreciation state in all this time, it is another inner mountain state. And you know, it is one of my favorite U.S. states to visit with all of its great national parks in the southern part of this state. It's also known as the Beehive State. You know, number one is also a state where I left my Pennsylvania college for one year, my sophomore year, and I did a one-year national student exchange program in this state. And that is, as you might have guessed it by now, the state of Utah. It is number one with 599% cumulative single-family home price appreciation since 1991. Yes, you have basically 6 x your dollars in Utah, but understand you haven't necessarily 6 x your prosperity here because there's nothing about inflation-adjusted dollars in this beautiful, colorful map here. So we're talking about nominal dollars here. It still gives you an apples-to-apples, state-to-state comparison though. And what about the worst, the worst five states for appreciation since 1991 are Delaware in 47th place. It had 183% appreciation and then trending worse and worse. 48th place in appreciation is West Virginia. 49th is Mississippi. Next is Illinois. And the 51st best, which is therefore the worst, and there are 51 since we're including D.C. here, And, you know, I'm a little surprised at this state, the worst, the lowest home price appreciation in the last 31 years. Now, I thought that this state could be below average, but surely not the worst. And really, this is a pretty meaningful number when you're looking at over three decades of housing market vibrancy and prosperity and demand and desire to live in a place. This state is known as the Nutmeg State, but it's probably better known by its more popular nickname, the Constitution State, which I know was on its license plate for a while. The surprise really to me is that it includes bedroom communities of the most prosperous place probably in American history and a high population density. So with appreciation of just 137% since 1991, Yes, we are talking about Connecticut. Yeah, Connecticut. Poor Connecticut. They even lost the Hartford Whalers NHL team (laughs) during this span of time. Visual Capitalist got third data from the FHFA, and the methodology is average price changes in repeat sales on the same property. That's just so you know exactly what I'm telling you about here. You would love to pour over this colorful map, And hopefully you already did because I sent it to you in our Don't Quit Your Daydream newsletter 10 days ago. If you're not getting that letter, you can sign up for it free at getricheducation.com slash letter. Well, that was since 1991, but what's going on in today's housing market? I've talked about how both year-over-year home prices and rental prices are appreciating faster than historic norms. We all know that. That leads me to remind you to look at statistics closely and really look into what they mean. Really look into what they're trying to tell you. A case in point here, people that are brand new to real estate, they might see a headline from time to time that reads something like, real estate sales are falling. Mm, To an uninitiated person, to a beginner, that might make them think that, well, housing values must be falling if sales are falling. Or if sales are falling, well, then housing prices are going to fall really soon. Well, neither of those things are true. Declining sales, that means that the number of sold homes has fallen. And this could be indicative that there's not enough supply to sell. I've been talking about supply a lot in the last couple years here. A person cannot buy what isn't for sale. So that can make the sales volume drop, even if demand is high. And that's a phenomenon that's really been happening for the last few years. So that's why a headline that reads that real estate sales are falling could be misleading. And now here's another recent headline that I saw that can get readers thinking the wrong thing. And let's see what you think about this. And this is a real headline recently. 
11% of April listings saw price cuts by the end of May. That's the headline. All right, what's that mean to you? That's not about sales volume. That's specifically that price cuts are a reality. Well, even that doesn't mean that the median home price is falling. In fact, it's not. Sellers making 11% price cuts to their listing is mostly a function of unrealistic asking prices. There are not many stories of homes selling for a lower price than the last comparable sale, that's for sure. See, when home sellers already know that there has been 20% year-over-year price appreciation, well, then they set their price in anticipation of that. Well, then if they set it up high and they cut their price down 11% from where they originally listed it in order to get it sold, well, then that might be more indicative of, say, 9 to 10% price appreciation is happening or something similar. It sure isn't exact. So giving you some context here, looking behind the numbers, declining sales and even price cuts, that doesn't mean that the median price of the same existing home between sales is falling. I'm about to talk to Tom. We're right here momentarily. First, I hope that you're having a good summer. As a guy that's lived his life in northern states here, Pennsylvania and Alaska, I really enjoy this time of year more than most. In fact, the weather is so agreeable that I'm spending much of my summer in Anchorage, Alaska. And now, if you're a new listener, you might be saying to yourself, really? What? Where? Yeah, I've talked to you before about how good the Anchorage summers are. It is quite common to have a low temperature at night of, say, 55 degrees and daytime highs of like around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And for me, it's just right for doing a lot of exercise outdoors. And when someone asks me what I'm doing in Anchorage during the summer, I'm really doing two main things. I study the housing market, and I've been competing in these mountain running races. How it works is you're at sea level, you kind of rip your shirt off and Whoever gets to the summit of a 3,000-foot mountain first wins the race. Where the trail is steep, you might even use your hands to pull yourself up. And where the trail levels out, you run. And oh, there's just such amazing scenery and landscapes where the mountain meets the sea. So, yep, that's really part of my life this summer. It's a good counterpoint to being in a studio and doing the podcasts and videos and the newsletter. And I love doing this stuff, but I need to balance out the sedentary nature of some of those things in the studio. And then, you know, you'll find this interesting. There's a real paradox here. When I leave Anchorage and travel to Pennsylvania, where I'm from, people figure that I must be leaving a rural area and going to Pennsylvania, which is urban. Nope, it's exactly the opposite. Anchorage is a city of about 300,000 people. And where I'm from in upstate Pennsylvania, Potter County, Pennsylvania, to be exact, that entire county only has a population of 16,000. In fact, there might be a higher population of white-tailed deer than human beings in Potter County, Pennsylvania. I'm not sure on that one. And it is so far from urban areas that it gets so completely dark at night that my dad is a night sky photographer of celestial bodies there, like the Milky Way and planets and constellations. That's something that my parents do together. And my dad has listened to every single GRE podcast as well. So, you know, he knows what's going on. Hey, well, I guess I'm trying to humanize the episode a bit more before we talk about how you can permanently reduce your taxes, whether you have a day job and no real estate income, or you own 5,000 apartment units. Let's talk to Tom Wheelwright. This week's guest is the founder of WealthAbility. He helps you permanently and legally reduce your taxes. His book, Tax-Free Wealth, has been a bestseller for 10 years, and he's the author of a new book, The Win-Win Wealth Strategy, Seven Investments the Government Will Pay You to Make. And he doesn't need much of an introduction because he is the most recurrent guest in show history. Welcome back to Get Rich Education, the terrific Tom Wheelwright. Thanks, Keith. Always good to be with you guys and your listeners. Tom, the reason that you're most 
recurrent guest that we've ever had here is because you're one of the very few people that can make taxes entertaining. And it's also really informative. Like I learn quite a bit from you on these shows. I think much like our viewers and listeners do, because I'm just not going to keep up with the minutes of Congress or the latest on the House Ways and Means Committee or wherever a lot of this policy comes from. But your book, The Win-Win Wall Strategy, has such an interesting subtitle, The Seven Investments That the Government Will Pay You to Make. So tell us about those. What I decided to do was look at what does the government actually want taxpayers to do? What do they want? What do they incentivize? And so we picked from the government's viewpoint, the seven most popular incentives the government provides from a tax standpoint. And we actually looked at both sides of it. We looked at the government side of it. And we looked at the taxpayer side of it. So what does the government get out of these incentives and what does the taxpayer get out of them? And really interesting, Keith, the government actually gets more out of it than the taxpayer. So the fact that the government's giving incentives, this is not a loophole. These are not things that are unintentional. The government is actually making money on it. Okay. Now you could say, well, people would do these things other anyway, but we don't know that. And what we do know, because... John F. Kennedy, back in the early 60s, did a test. And he said, if we give an incentive at that time, it was for manufacturing equipment. If we give a small tax incentive, will we get more manufacturing equipment placed in service? That was really the goal, that we were in a bit of a recession, wanted to simulate manufacturing. And lo and behold, it worked. I think it's pretty obvious as why it worked is because people hate paying taxes. So there's an emotional response to it, not just a monetary response to it. I did a podcast the other day. The um, guest was saying people respond first with emotion. And so when I look at taxes, I'm going, okay, so by the way, that's why it's tax-free wealth because that's an emotional topic, right? But what most people think is, If the government wins, I'm going to lose. And the only way for me to win is to cheat. People who make a lot of money and pay little tax, they must be cheating. That would be the rich, right? That's why this whole thing about tax the rich. When in fact, that's not how the tax law works. The way the tax law works is, yes, the government will always win. But you can win also if you do what the government wants done. Because there are so many incentives, seven specific areas of the economy, where if you invest directly into those incentives, the government will literally pay you by reducing other taxes. They'll pay you to make that investment. So that's kind of the idea behind it, Keith. And then uh, I would say, you know, the second idea is you really have a choice. You can be a silent partner with the government. You can be an active partner with the government. But the fact is you're a partner with the government. So just choose which one you're going to be. You're going to be a silent partner, pay a lot of tax, or an active partner and pay very little tax. I think we all want to be an active partner. And since the subtitle of your book is Seven Investments That the Government Pays You to Make, I know that three of those are classics, investing in food, housing, or energy. Tell us about some of those other seven investments that the government will pay you to make. Number one, businesses by far, and this is around the world. So we looked at 15 different countries. We actually have 150 endnotes for 15 different countries. The last 60 pages of the book are endnotes to just actually show where we got our information. And what it turns out that business is the most incentivized by governments throughout the world. So business is very important. The second most incentivized is besides agriculture would probably be agriculture, but then you would have real estate. Real estate's a very highly incentivized, whether it's housing, commercial property, et cetera. And uh, as long as you add debt to it. Now, real estate gets tax incentives, whether you have debt or not, but that debt can multiply those incentives and it multiplies the tax benefits by three, four or five times, depending on how much debt you put, how much debt you use, you can multiply your tax benefits simply by using other people's money. So those are a few. Technology is another one that people don't typically think about. But if you think about, okay, now who are the richest people in the world who haven't paid tax for the last 20 years? Well, that would be Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, both high in the technology world. The reason that Amazon and Tesla didn't pay tax for the first 20 years of their existence is because of tax incentives. That's the reason. So yes, they lost money in the early years, but then they had research and development tax credits to pay for even when they were making money so that they actually paid little or no tax. 
Now, you brought up the names of a couple of famous, really wealthy people. There seems to be this sentiment out there. I don't know whether it's growing or not, but it's awfully pervasive. And that is one where people say, tax the rich. And a lot of times the people that say that, I don't know if they have a complete understanding of how capitalism and economies work. You're talking about entrepreneurs here that took on risk themselves in order to create a job for you and create value for you. I'm not even saying whether it's good or bad, Keith. I'm pretty agnostic when it comes to tax incentives. All I'm saying is, is that they do seem to work. Let me give you an example. I doubt that there's anybody who owns a home who doesn't deduct their mortgage interest. I'm sure they all do. That's a tax incentive. I'm sure there's nobody who sends their kids to college who doesn't take the education tax credits. So it's very disingenuous for people to say, well, the rich get these incentives and their incentives are bad. My incentives are okay. The last incentive that I look at in the book is uh, retirement plans. Well, retirement plans, I think there isn't a soul on the planet that thinks, oh, this is a really bad idea. We shouldn't give tax benefits for for saving for retirement. No, everybody is okay with that. That, interestingly enough, is the one investment that the government will pay you to make where the government doesn't make money on it. The government actually pretty much breaks even, at least according to the numbers that I ran. The rich should pay more tax. I'm going, well, first of all, the rich pay all the tax. So the poor don't pay any tax. 50% of Americans pay little or absolutely zero tax. And uh, the tax rates are such where you really have to make pretty good income to pay tax at all. And you could be making $100,000, $200,000 a year and still pay very little tax. So I think it's very disingenuous, frankly. This is why I wrote the book, because I felt like we needed to have this conversation. We need to kind of point out to the world that if somebody's very wealthy and they don't pay any tax, it's probably not because they're cheating. Now, are there rich people who cheat? I'm guessing there, there might be, but I will tell you this. Rich people almost always have CPAs and CPAs don't cheat. It's not in our makeup. We would lose our license over it. We would lose our livelihood. And CPAs are the most honest people I know. So, you know, to say that the rich cheat is to basically throw the CPA profession under the bus and say, well, you're either complicit in the rich cheating or you're stupid. I take exception to both of those because I think that most CPAs are pretty smart people and they're doing their best and they're following the law. Again, these are incentives. These are strategies that the government says, if you employ these strategies, we're going to contribute. If you don't employ the strategies, we're fine too. We're happy to take your tax. Now, I know one of the seven investments government pays you to make, I touched on it with the food before, is with agriculture. We talk about agricultural real estate here sometimes. The government's incentivizing basically people to provide the country with food security. That's a condition that exists back before what happened to the world in 2020. And you can think about how much more important was supply chain disruptions and everything else that food security is for a country with these agricultural incentives persisting. Oh, absolutely. You have agriculture incentives like that. Energy incentives work the same way, right? It's energy security, right? It's actually security for the nation. The economy runs on energy. So that's why energy, whether it's fossil fuel energy or whether it's renewable fuel energy, it's highly incentivized. Agriculture is so incentivized. I have literally don't recall a situation where I had a client that was in agriculture that paid tax. Amazing. I mean, do we really want our farmers to spend their money on tax? Do we want them reinvesting the money in food? You don't have a whole lot of what you think of, oh, wow, farmer, you must be rich. Right? That's not really the visual that comes, right? When we think about farmers, we think about them in overalls harvesting in October, right? That's what we think of. Sure. I thought about his Bezos differently than the farmer. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But Bezos is the one who brings it to you. So, you know, the reality is, is that are there wealthy people in agriculture? Absolutely. And some of those do pay tax, but the average farmer or rancher is going to pay very little tax because the tax incentives are so high. We're talking with Tom Wheelwright. He's the author of the new book called The Win-Win Wealth Strategy, Seven Investments That the Government Will Pay You to Make. He's going to tell us about how you can potentially buy a Ferrari, all with tax write-offs. You're listening to Get Rich Education. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. 
you can get a 50-year-old house somewhere or buy a new one directly from the builder with tenant resilient amenities already built in. With over 3,000 Florida units at different construction stages, they are exclusively for investors. President Wagner and Alaska and team also invest strongly in their own product. That's belief. Start at buildtorentdirect.com. That's build the number two rentdirect.com or text 407-927-5074. Hey, my friend Damian Lupo informed me the checkbook IRAs have been made illegal by the U.S. tax court. If you have a checkbook IRA, your holdings are now disqualified with taxes and penalties up to 50%. But don't panic. Damien and the EQRP company can fix this. Those IRAs can be converted into EQRPs retroactive to last year, getting those tax deductions and reducing your taxable income. In this way, you can invest your 401k or IRA in real estate, Bitcoin, gold, and even your own business. So whether you're a full-time investor or retired or even a dentist with dozens of employees, if you're listening, you qualify, the EQRP works. It's a solution. You'll control your money, kill UBIT, and pay way less taxes. To learn more about this strategy and free up your retirement money, get the newest EQRP special report. Text GRE to 307-213-3475. That's text GRE to 307-213-3475. This is the Real Wealth Network's Kathy Becky, and you are listening to the always valuable Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold. Welcome back to Get Rich Education. We're talking with Wealth Abilities. Tom, we're right. He's the author of a fresh new book called The Win-Win Wealth Strategy, Seven Investments That the Government Will Pay You to Make. I know, Tom, that you have a story about, in a sense, how someone paid for a Ferrari legally with the government's money. Tell us about that. The first time I looked at this was actually a Porsche, not a Ferrari. And this was uh, Robert Kiyosaki. We were in Santiago, Chile a number of years ago. And he actually asked me, he says, can you teach him how to deduct a Porsche? I said, well, because Porsches aren't deductible in Chile, just FYI. We got up and and we actually showed how his Porsche, the government actually was paying him to buy that Porsche. And I'm going, well, if it works with a Porsche, it probably works with a Ferrari. And so I've got a a friend who's a very public client of mine, Brad Sumrock, and you probably know in the real estate industry, great real estate educator like yourself. I knew Brad wanted to buy a Ferrari. And I said, Brad, so let's look at how do we get the government to pay for your Ferrari? So we actually looked at where he could put his money so that the tax incentives were enough to pay for that down payment and that the ongoing payments would be paid for with his investment. So we looked at it, we ran the numbers and sure enough, the government literally is paying for his Ferrari. I mean, it is going on right now. He's still making payments on it and the government is paying for it. We have a picture of he and his uh, wife, adorable wife, Jen, with their Ferrari in the book. These are real numbers that we used. Pretty much a lot of times in the book, I did use real numbers, including with the Ferrari. It's not that the government wants you to buy a Ferrari. It's just that the government so much wants you to do these other things. For Brad, it was real estate. Somebody else, it might be business. Somebody else, it might be energy or agriculture, but they so much want you to do it. The literally the tax savings are sufficient to go out and buy yourself a Ferrari, beach home, a Tesla, whatever else you want. That's an amazing testimony about how there's not a low ceiling on these investments that you can make and the resultant benefits that you get from them. Well, you think about it. So love him or hate him. Donald Trump is certainly one of the things he's famous for is his tax situation, right? He said in 2016, when Hillary Clinton accused not paying tax, he said it's because he was smart. Rich people all have good tax advisors. They don't have to understand the law so much because they have really good tax advisors to understand the law. But then fast forward in 2020, the New York Times actually got a hold of his tax returns for 15 years and showed that 10 out of 15, he didn't pay tax at all. In two years, he paid, I think, $750 in each of those years, which you know, wow. to me, is, his accountant should have been fired for that. But why? And in fact, I don't know if he still is in this lawsuit with the IRS, but in one year, he actually got a $72 million refund. So how do you get a $72 million refund? Well, he paid a bunch of tax 
on his earnings from The Apprentice. And then he invested that money into his real estate business. And as a result, he got a tax refund. Uh, this is something, yes, the rich do this all the time, but it doesn't mean just because the rich do it. There's also not a floor. You said there's not a ceiling. There's also not a floor. The average person who buys a single family home or a duplex or a fourplex can also get the same tax benefits that got Donald Trump a $72 million refund. They may get you a $7,200 refund or they may get you a $72,000 refund. But in any case, it's very tax, it's, we call it tax effective investing because not only are you not paying tax on the income, for example, from your real estate, but you're also not paying tax on your wages that you used in order to buy the real estate. That's a little bit of magic. And we just need to recognize whether you like it or not, that's the way the tax law works. And uh, politicians love to use the tax law because they love having the power of taxation, which is their number one power. And they use it for good and evil. And in this case, it's a win-win for both the taxpayer and the government. And this can be rather head spinning for the ordinary person because the ordinary person, they think about taxes differently and their income is treated differently because most people, you can think of it as they actually pay their taxes first. It's knocked out of their paycheck. They do. They've got FICA. I mean, it's like great episode of Friends early on, first season of Friends where Rachel gets her first paycheck and she says, I can't believe I got this paycheck. I worked for this. I waited tables for this. I bust tables for this. And it was totally not worth it. Who's FICA? And, <laughs> and I mean, it's one of my favorite clips of any show because she's illustrating that, look, we're all partners with the government. And most people are silent partners and they get the taxes taken out first. And there are those who choose following Get Rich Education. They actually choose to be active partners with the government. And the government just says, We'll give you a choice. You can be a silent partner, pay a lot of tax. You can be an active partner and pay little or no tax. Chapter four of your new book, that focuses on real estate. Oftentimes, one doesn't understand until they become a real estate investor that, oh, my income, my rental income is taxed differently than my income from my day job. In fact, I pay a different effective tax rate on those two things. For example, one's day job income often has FICA, social security tax knocked out of it, and rental income does not. So talk to us about the difference in tax rate between income from a day job versus that from rental income. Rental income is not subject to social security taxes. So that's 12.3% that you're not paying. 12.3%. That's, that's a big a deal. Big dollar. I mean, for a lot of people, that's more than their income tax rate. Consider that on top of that with depreciation, you're probably not paying income tax either. You're not paying social security tax and you're not paying income tax. Whereas with your job, you're paying both income tax and social security tax. So we always say that the very first thing to look at with a, when a new client comes to us is how are you using your money? If you're spending it or saving it, you're probably going to pay tax on it. But if you reinvest it, particularly into real estate, agriculture, business technology, you're not going to pay tax on it. So it's very much a choice that every one of us has the opportunity to make once we learn that we have that choice. Now, your book touches on tax depreciation. You mentioned depreciation. I think a lot of people still don't understand the depreciation benefit for real estate investors. Tell us about it. So basically, it's just, you know, you're just getting a deduction for the wear and tear on your building. But it's not just the building itself, because remember, you also bought the land improvements, such as the, in my case, landscaping doesn't last very long because I will kill it. Okay. My <laughs> wife, it will last longer, but the government says it's going to last about 15 years. And same with your covered parking, same with your outdoor lighting, things like that. Those are land improvements, about 15 years. So instead of over 27 and a half or 39 years, like you would have to do with a building, you get to deduct it faster. And then the contents of the building, we all know, especially you have a renters uh, tend to be harsh on the contents of your building. And so the government says, well, that's probably going to last anywhere from five to seven years. That's the most. What happened in 2017, though, is the government said, okay, for the next few years, we're going to allow you to deduct 100% of both your land improvements and the contents of your building in the year you buy the building and place it into service. A lot of times that can be 20, 30% of your purchase price. If you get a professional cost segregation person to do a cost segregation on it, that's a lot of money. That means you could put down $100,000 on a $500,000 building and get a $100,000 deduction 
in the very first, the, the day you close on the building. Amazing. Uh, the huge, huge number. And all, not many countries have that kind of a tax benefit for real estate. It is an enormous benefit. And people should realize also that we have a little window of opportunity right now because that benefit starts diminishing in 2023. So 2023, it goes down to 80%. 2024, 60%, and then 2025 and after that, 50%. So we do have a window of opportunity right now. If you're thinking about what do I do with my money to keep up with inflation, real estate might be a good option. Hey, we're talking about the bonus depreciation benefit sunsetting over time. Tom, why don't you talk to us about the basic depreciation benefit? Maybe it's easiest to use an example of, say, a $140,000 rental property where the improved portion of the property is worth one hundred dollars and the land is worth forty dollars How does tax depreciation work? Your bonus depreciation, you're probably going to get about $20,000 of that, twenty dollars to $25,000 right off the bat. But then remember, you still got the building. And let's say your building is 50% of that or $50,000. Well, that means that you're going to get about three and a half percent a year on that fifty thousand dollars, which is about seventeen or fifty dollars every year. You're going to get a deduction for seven hundred and fifty dollars, even if the building is perfectly good after twenty seven and a half years. So it doesn't matter whether it actually wears out. You get the deduction, and by the way, it doesn't matter if it's a new building or a used building. The U.S. is unusual that way. A lot of countries only give you depreciation once. That is on a new building. They give it to you, but on a used building, you don't get it. We actually can get depreciation over and over again because you can take depreciation. Then when you sell it to me, I can take depreciation. And because of 1031 exchanges, you don't necessarily have to pay tax on that gain. Sure. I still get the deduction. So we literally can take depreciation deductions multiple times from multiple investors. And Tom, I like how in your book, you have a section on tax depreciation that I have never seen before. It's about how other nations in the world also have this benefit. Now, in the United States, we can depreciate our property between 27 and a half and 39 years. In your book, you have these nice at-a-glance tables where, for example, I could see in Spain, it takes you longer to depreciate that, meaning the benefit is not as good. It's 68 to 100 years in Spain, and then it's shorter in a place like Mexico, where it's between 10 and 20 years. The details are different from country to country, which is why you have a good tax advisor, which is why at WealthAbility, we have a network of 60 CPA firms that we train to make sure that they have your back. And so you do need somebody to help you with the details. I think what's critical is to understand the context and the concepts behind the tax law, because once we understand that, it changes our point of view and we're able to say, well, wait a minute, if Jeff Bezos can get these benefits, why can't I? If uh, Donald Trump can get these tax benefits, why can't I? And really the only difference is if you're not getting the benefits is because they have more education and better tax advisors than you do. But uh, the reality is, is that everybody can get them. Everybody gets these benefits. We have constitution that means that if one person gets the benefit, everybody gets the benefit. Tom, I know a lot of people have been looking forward to this book, which was just freshly published a few days ago, because so many people have gotten value from your first book a while back called Tax-Free Wealth. So is there any last thing that we ought to know about your new book, The Win-Win Wealth Strategy? Just a reminder that the more income you earn, the more tax you pay, but the more assets you build, the more wealth you build, the less tax you pay. So Win-Win Wealth Strategy is very much a sequel and intended as a sequel to Tax-Free Wealth. So I would definitely be reading both of them. You can read Win-Win Wealth without Tax-Free Wealth, but I suggest both books. You know, Tax-Free Wealth is basically a primer on reducing your taxes. Win-Win Wealth is a primer on building wealth. Why not make it a win-win? It doesn't have to be a win-lose strategy when it comes to taxes. You can win and have, frankly, make way more money and pay way less tax. To you, the listener and the viewer here, maybe some great ways to increase your income or to buy a rental property or to get a promotion at work. And maybe I should do those things. But in addition to those things, perhaps the easiest way to increase your effective income is to reduce your taxes. And Tom's new book is a roadmap for that. Tom, tell our audience where they can get the new book. Easiest way is amazon.com. Go to Amazon. I am a big fan of Jeff Bezos because he <laughs> gets my book sold. And so Amazon is a really easy place. Uh, Barnes and Noble certainly would have it. Uh, Books a million, you know, any place. I mean, it's, it's 
published by Wiley, one of the largest publishers in the world. So it's going to be in pretty much any place you go, you're going to be able to find the book. But I would go to Amazon or uh, we do have a website, winwinwaltstrategy.com. And you're welcome to go there. But frankly, Amazon is probably just as easy. There's Bezos creating value again. Again, the name of the book is The Win-Win Wealth Strategy, Seven Investments That the Government Will Pay You to Make. Tom, we're right. It's been valuable as always. Thanks so much for coming back onto the show. Thank you, Keith. Yeah, great plain spoken stuff from Tom, as always. I think you probably heard before that farmers often get tremendous tax benefits and subsidies. It's interesting, when you think about it, when you go out and buy a rental property, if it happens to be vacant at the time that you purchase it, well, you expect to find a rent-paying tenant in a matter of weeks or even days in today's hot market, and they're going to pay your rent for that year most of the time. But think about a farmer. They borrow money to put it in the dirt and then they go hope that it rains. Okay, they have no idea how their next year is going to look. If it doesn't rain for three months, that doesn't affect the residential rental property investor very much. Hey, coming up on the show here in future weeks, it's me with real estate expert Kathy Fetke. Hostage negotiator Chris Voss. She should I be intimidated about that show? He is from Masterclass and he's going to give you some great real estate negotiation techniques. Also, speaking of agriculture, we're going to get an update on what's happening with teak trees. Yeah, teak hardwood investing about how you can invest in quarter acre parcels of growing trees. So you own the land. It's titled to you. Yet it's managed by others, like to do the thinnings and things, and you can enjoy potential appreciation in both the value and the volume of the trees, and it's so uncorrelated with other assets. That's another show that I really look forward to. And then further down the road, it's terrific Tom Wheelwright yet again. Tom is going to keep, I guess, extending his lead as the most recurrent guest in show history, which is 20-some shows by now as we get his take on inflation and the Fed raising interest rates, be sure to check out Tom's brand new book, The Win-Win Wealth Strategy. We expect to get another Fed interest rate decision on the 27th, just nine days from now. I'm keeping you up to date on that in your Don't Quit Your Daydream letter, which again, you can get free at getricheducation.com slash letter. I'll be back for you here next week. Hit subscribe on your podcatcher if you want to be sure you don't miss all of our great upcoming content. I'm Keith Weinhold. I've been grateful to have you here. Don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.